All right. Hello. Welcome, class, and um, welcome to the third chapter, I guess you could call it, of our course on uh, LMI methods and optimal and robust control. In this or in this series of lectures, uh, we're going to expand on our work. Uh, so in chapters one, uh, we, uh, we talked about, well, defined LMIs. We talked about state space and some of the basics of, uh, of control systems and, and uh, things like that. In chapter two, we talked about optimal control. So we identified what we were trying to optimize, the H-infinity norm of uh, exogenous inputs to regulated outputs. And we solved a bunch of problems for the H2 norm, the H-infinity norm, and so forth. And now in chapter three, we're going to deal with some of the problems, really, that we created in chapters one and two. Uh, by turning to the problem of robust control. So what is the what is the reason for doing robust control? Well, as we talked about in chapters, well, one and two, the use of optimization algorithms is dangerous. And uh, thus, the, the, in some ways, uh, the use of the Solving problems of optimal control, designing optimal controllers, is a little bit dangerous. Because if you remember what optimization algorithms do, right, they're, they're ruthless. They're, uh, they're algorithms, they're greedy, they will keep on going. Um, and they will keep going until they potentially break your system if you don't constrain them in, in an appropriate way. So we are quite careful in our section on optimal control to make sure that our algorithms were doing what we want them to do, that they're actually solving the optimal optimization problem that we defined very carefully. And that gives us some hope or some confidence that the controllers that we get out aren't too dangerous. Optimization is one of those sort of um, things where it's dangerous to know a little because if you don't properly set up your optimization algorithm and actually solve the problem you're looking for, then you can end up with something which is liable to break your system. Now, we feel confident that we've solved the optimal control problem, and so we've avoided that danger to some extent. Um, in this series of lectures, however, we will address a problem which is inherent in the optimal control problem in that, if you remember the, uh, the famous George Box quote, uh, all models are wrong, and so, but some are useful. Uh, so we're going to like look a little bit about, concentrate on that wrong part, right? All models are wrong, right? but some are useful. Well, we'll put limits on, uh, on, on the utility, because uh, remember, right, that uh, if you, when you apply optimal control to a wrong model, you can get things which do things which you didn't intend. And so in this series of lectures, we're going to focus on putting limits on how wrong our model could be in order to get controllers which are safe. wrong to get controllers which are safe even if we are uh, wrong in our model uh, in a limited sense in that we're, we're wrong within the limits that we impose on it. And furthermore, we'd not like them to not just be safe, but we'd have the we'd like them to have some uh, associated maybe performance met metrics so that they're guaranteed to perform ad adequately, even if our model is wrong to some limited extent. Now, 
Okay, so that's that's the goal. We have we've got a, we've got our say our four system or uh, four system uh, representation or our nine matrix representation. All right. So that's our model of the system. And in this lecture, this introductory lecture, we're going to talk about all the things that can go wrong with these systems. Errors in the model. So we're going to focus on errors in the model and um, sort of try and quantify ways in which the models are wrong and place limits on to the extent that our models are wrong. So, okay, let's give an example of this. Um, say, for example, uh, you design a car, right? Uh, here's a car. Um, okay, that's our car. Very nice. Uh, it, uh, it is designed, it has, we have a model for it. We designed it, the model's pretty accurate. What are all the ways that that model can be wrong? Well, there's some obvious ones that we just can't deal with. Uh, so first of all, right, uh, the tires might be flat or they might have different air pressure, air pressure in the tires. Uh, the uh, gas tank might be full or empty, so weight might change. Uh, there might be some wind, right, blowing on our car. We might be going uphill. We might be going downhill. Uh, there might be passengers in our car, right? There might be one. There might be two. There might be four. Maybe there's none. Maybe it's a self-driving car. Who knows? Uh, so you can see that even with the best of models, there's going to be some error, right? There's just no way of, design, of modeling this car which is going to be 100% accurate 100% of the time, right? And so in this lecture, we're gonna talk about ways of quantifying the effects of these uncertainties in a way which is rigorous, in a way which is mathematically formulated and allows us to then combine these models, these robust models So this is the top of, of today's lecture, robust modeling, with optimal control in a way which has, say, guaranteed safety and performance metrics. So let's talk then about the sources of uncertainty. And there is really no limit to the number of things that can go wrong in life, right? I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's just basic uh, a common sense that you can't completely quantify the unknowns. Um, so I think it was uh, Donald Rumsfeld famous quote, right? There are the, uh, the knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns, right? So obviously we can't do much with the unknown unknowns. So we're gonna focus to the extent possible on uh, quantifying or knowing the unknowns. So dealing with the things, the, modeling the things that we can model in terms of uncertainties. Okay. To some extent in optimal control, uh, we've already tried to quantify some of these uh, sources of uncertainties. Um, so for example, in our optimal control framework, we have exogenous inputs. Right? These are things which are not known. They were trying to basically minimize the effect of these uh, exogenous inputs on our regulated outputs, which is what we care about. Right? So to some extent, right, we already have certain models of uncertainty, process noise, sensor noise. These are the easiest class of, uh, of, um, of uncertainties to deal with, the, the external disturbances, exogenous disturbances. They're the easiest to deal with, and they're the most benign because, at least in H infinity, optimal control, we've already dealt with them, right? We've, we've, in fact, H infinity control, in a way, 
is already robust in that it attempts to minimize the effect of these uncertainties on our regulated output. So age infinity is already robust in a certain sense. In fact, age infinity optimal control is often referred to as robust control, although as we'll see that definition is quite limited. So in some sense, we've already dealt with those. So we're not going to focus too much on these, these cases of external disturbances. So when we talked about the car, right, modeling the car, uh, the uh, vibrations due to the road, for example, road vibrations, wind on the car, uh, in a sense, uh, the tracking input, right, uh, the, uh, the change in the, the, the driver's uh, set point. Uh, whether you're going uphill, whether you're going downhill. Uh, sensor noise, right, uh, fits into the model of a 60 hertz noise, right? So there's always 60 hertz noise in our electrical circuits if they're running on alternating current. Um, in some ways, uh, these other forms of optimal control are also robust in certain sense. So for example, LQR uh, minimizes the effect of initial conditions. Only that, only in that sense is it robust, however. LQR, for example, has no model of exogenous inputs. Well, H2 does. So LQR is, is not very robust. So I don't want to say that LQR is, not, is, is robust because it's really not. Um, so, but H2 is, a, is robust in a certain sense because it deals with noise. Um, and of course, we talked about uh, changes in the reference signal. And we talked about sensor noise already. So these are the easy cases, these benign sources of uncertainty. We've already dealt with them to some extent when we designed H-infinity optimal controllers. Of course, if we've already dealt with them, why are we having a lecture? And, and, and of course, this lecture does not deal with the benign sources of uncertainty because they're already dealt with. It deals with the more pernicious uh, sources of uncertainty, things which you cannot necessarily be bounded a priori. And let me say a little bit about what that means. Um, so let me, let me identify first a few of these sources, and then I'll say what that means. So for example, right, uh, you say you take a UAV, right, uh, with some helicopter there, UAV. Right. Obviously, wind is a, is a benign source of uncertainty, but there may be other, not less benign sources of uncertainty. So, for example, we don't know how much the thing we're carrying weighs. So, say it's an Amazon drone, it's carrying a package here, right? Uh, mass of the package. Let's say there's a, uh, it's hang something's hanging from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, the drone, um, then uh, that, that, mo that weight has a, a little bit of mass, uh, then that is another set of dynamics, unmodeled states, which we haven't included in our model. Okay. Uh, there may be lots of other things, like vibration in the, uh, in the rotor braids. Lots of, um, lots of dynamics here. These are, these are dynamics, I'll highlight them. Unmodeled uh, uh, states, vibration. These are dynamics, um, which are coupled with the sort of nominal dynamics, which maybe we model as like a brick, F equals MA or something like that. Right. So, and here's that, uh, that other source of uncertainty, the mass that we don't know about. Okay. So these blue, pink ones then yield extra states uh, for our model, our, a state-space model, which haven't been included in our model. So they're extra dynamics, which we, can't, we haven't accounted for. And that's, uh, that's pretty problematic because those extra states, because they are coupled to the system that we're actually controlling. 
the size of those states can't be bounded a priori, right? So if they have some input, the states may be large at times, small at times, we don't know because they have dynamics. They can grow, they can shrink, and so on and so forth. They have some dynamics which are coupled to our nominal dynamics, and there may be resonances or vibrations which could destabilize the system, for example. Right. I'll highlight that. Um, on the other side, the mass, right? Mass is, uh, in this case, is more of a, what we call a parametric uncertainty, right? It's already included. There's no extra states that are, need to be included in our state space model, right? Let's say x dot equals um, ax. That's our nominal system. But there's some error in our a, right, due to this mass. And so this a depends on our mass. And so we can uh, let's, we can write it as a plus uh, the error in the mass times x of t, right? and that error in the mass. What is the effect of that? Well, it's obvious it can't just be included as an exogenous input, right? These exogenous inputs uh, add to add to signals. They don't multiply states, right? So that's a problem. Because these exogenous inputs multiply the states, and the states are not necessarily bounded, right? The effect of this error can it cannot be bounded either. Right? So that's a problem. <clears throat> Other sources of uncertainty. So for example, if we're controlling this UAV remotely through a uh, say a communications tower over here, let's put. A communication tower and it's got a little radar dish there do, 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 do. and uh, so we're, our input is uh, is determined by our at our at our communication dish right there's going to be some delay between when this signal gets sent out when it gets received by the UAV when the sensors on the UAV measure its state and when that information gets sent back. So a delay there in tau is usually how we represent the effect of delay. There's a delay in that signal, a delay in that signal going forward. And uh, so this is sensor and this is uh, command. Right? So some delay. And delay is particularly pernicious in terms of uncertainty because it actually represents an infinite number of unmodeled uh, states, right? So a delay uh, is represented in the frequency domain as something like that, which if you plot the roots of this, equals zero, right, there's an infinite number of roots. So there's an infinite number of states associated with a delay. And so we can, we should really include delay in our additional state kind of uh, grouping here. Uh, similarly, uh, model reduction. So often we have a model of the system, which comes through maybe system identification. Oops, sorry, wrong arrow. Oops. So we have a, a, a plant and we, uh, we want to control it, so we use system identification. That's a different course, not this course, to identify a, mo a good model for the system. And it gives us some horrible Bode plot, right? Uh, so, well, maybe it's not a horrible Bode plot, but it gives us a Bode plot. This ID. So we, uh, we do some frequency sweeping and we get a Bode plot. Uh, there's magnitude, there's phase or something like that, right? And then we try and match that Bode plot to a transfer function. Uh, I think I'm going off the screen here, sorry about that. Uh, so we try and match that Bode plot to a transfer function. Right? And then we get a very high order uh, rational transfer function. One with lots and lots of states, right? Because obviously to capture that Bode plot accurately, we need a really high, uh, po high degree polynomial. Or rational transfer function. Right? So we need a really high degree one, which means there are lots of states in that model. 
Now, which of those states are real, which are necessary, we don't know. And so model reduction is the process of taking that identified model and trimming off the states that we don't think really matter. But of course, if we trim off the states that we don't think really matter, well, we can't actually bound those states a priori. And so they, they're in there, they're in the actual dynamics, but we just haven't modeled them. So they become now a source of uncertainty. Right? And one of these certainty, uncertainties which uh, add states to the system. So the pink ones add uh, parameters, unmodeled parameters, and the blue ones add states to the system. Our third source of uncertainties right, uh, here is, uh, is errors in the structure of our model. And here I'm running out of space. I'm going to erase a few things. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff because we're not doing the benign stuff anymore. Uh, so structure of a system. So remember in this class and in actually most uh, controls uh, applications, we use linear models of the systems, right? linear models. And where do those linear models come from? Well, they come from, uh, say, a nonlinear model, so an accurate one. So, for example, a pendulum, right, uh, is actually a nonlinear model. X double dot equals, I think it's uh, sine theta, right? Uh, mg sine theta, mgl or something like that, right? And we linearize that about our operating point, right, which is theta equals zero. And we get something very simple, which is uh, just MGL, right? But of course, if our, mm, our pendulum diverges from our operating point by any significant amount, this model instantaneously becomes wrong. And so there's that effect we have to deal with those. Uh, those uh, it's, not a, it's not an additional state. In a way, it's a error in the in the parameter you can think of it that way but it's a time varying one right so you can think of it as a time varying error in the in a er, time varying error in a parameter so let's just uh, connect the dots down here it goes to there right. and so this is actually an entirely different class of errors in our model which are due to non-linearity, and they get worse, of course, the farther away from our operating point we get. Um, another, of course, uh, source here is uh, not just errors in our model, but uh, saturation on in our inputs or actuators tend to respond something like this, right? So they're linear about uh, zero. So this is a zero. Uh, so this is our uh, this is uh, uh, the force that comes out of our actuator. And this is uh, our command input right here, U of T. Right, so we can uh, we give a command to this uh, this actuator, and it responds fairly well up to a certain limit. But then it can't it just can't generate any more force, and so it no longer behaves linearly. So we get this nonlinear uh, uh, actuator saturation. Right? So again, a source of unmodeled dynamics. It's not actually extra states, but it's a structural error in our model. And we'll give that its own color, structural error there. And likewise, uh, logical switching, right? Where you switch from model to model depending on where you are. So for example, gain scheduling is something that people sometimes use. And that results in a shift, a sudden instantaneous shift in the dynamics. And so a common example of that is an air conditioning system where it re reaches, say, a desired limit on the, the temperature uh, or tolerance on the temperature and then shuts off. So it does that instantaneously. So it's not linear uh, response you have there. Similar actually to a, an actu actuator signal, but very but different in a certain sense. So I'll just like highlight that. Right. So three different not benign sources of uncertainty. Unmodeled dynamics, right, coming in here and here. Extra states you're not accounting for. Structural errors in our model coming in here and here. 
and parametric or uh, errors in our uh, model. Uh, oh, hold on. Actually, I uh, messed that up. Model reduction is uh, is um, is actually blue or uh, pink here because that ex adds extra states to our our system. Right. And in this lecture, and in actually this, uh, this series of lectures, we're going to consider uh, the blue ones primarily, because they're the easiest to deal with. Uh, and to a lesser extent, we're also going to deal with these, uh, uh, these pink ones. Right? So um, they're harder to deal with, but we'll still be able to manage them to some extent. The, uh, the third source, the orange ones, uh, are harder to deal with. And so we're just, we'll have to approximate those errors as either uh, uh, these uh, higher order dynamics or maybe time varying uh, modeling errors, right? So if our mass depends on time, right? That would be sort of a way of dealing with these other cases. And if we have time at the end of the course, we'll come back and actually deal with logical switching specifically because we do have decent models of logical switching. So there we've gone over some of the sources of uh, uncertainty in our models. And so the whole point of this lecture is to allow us to uh, quantify those, to take a particular system, and we have a running example in here, and formulate the, these modeling errors in a way which we can handle uh, using optimization and optimal control. Right. So how do we do that? What, what's the step? Right. Those, the, the previous slide was was all just words. So let's take um, let's take a, a few of those cases we we considered. Uh, let's take um, a model reduction, for example. where we have extra states. Let's take um, parametric uncertainty, where we don't know, say, the mass of the car. And uh, finally, I suppose we'll take the, uh, uh, the nonlinearity, where we say we have the, the, the inverted, the pendulum problem. So there's three kinds of uncertainties. So how do we quantify these types of uncertainty? Well, obviously we need a model for how bad these things can get, right? It's this, uh, this is relatively easy to understand in, say, the parametric case, where, uh, say, we have limits on our mass. So we know our mass is, say, between um, uh, uh, nominal mass minus 10 and uh, nominal mass plus 10. We have an interval of possible masses which uh, the car can handle, let's say. Uh, model reduction is a, uh, is a little bit trickier. Uh, in that case, we have, say, our system, P, and it's coupled to a subsystem, delta, which uh, is dynamic, right? This is a dynamic system. And well, how big can the what's the how big can those unmodeled dynamics get? So a typical approach for these model reduction techniques is to assume that that uh, this subsystem has small gain in some sense that delta h infinity norm uh, map from inputs to output is less than one. Okay. So is it less than one or not? Well. Presumably, you can choose your how you, you model that in such a way that uh, the gains you put on those uncertainties such that it has norm less than one, no matter what the, uh, the size of the actual error is. Nonlinearity is a different fish, however. It's a bit tricky uh, because there's, it's really very hard to parameterize this in general, and we can't really give a general framework for doing this. I'll just give an example, however. So, for example... Um, the, uh, the, the sinusoid, sine theta, right? Now we, we have some, some dynamics in the, 
uh, in this uh, in this um, in this nonlinear model, right? It, it's dependent. Let's say theta dot equals sine theta or something like that. Or theta, I think it was theta double dot. Well, if we plot out sine theta, what does it look like? It looks like that, right? Looks like that. So what we can say is that um, that sine theta uh, looks uh, can be bounded, say, by uh, that that function lies in this region, for example. Right. So uh, that f of theta, right, is less than theta, and uh, f of theta is greater than negative theta, for example, right. So you can put limits on that function so that, right, this uh, this add double dot is between negative theta and theta, right. That's not a great parameterization of sine theta, I've got to say, but right, it's something. It's a way we can parameterize this nonlinearity. We're not going to focus on the nonlinear case in this lecture, but just know that we can do it, right. Anyway, uh, so basically we have to then so we, we started with a, um, a nominal system, right? A nominal system, P naught. Say it's a, uh, a state space system or something like that, A, B, C, D. And now we have actually a range of systems which it can lie within. And what's uh, it's important, uh, we're posing a restriction here on the set right of uh, of systems in that each we assume it's a system but we assume that it's within a range of linear systems right so that's that's a bit tricky but uh, we have to do it so basically we're going to take this optimal control problem where we're interconnecting our no a normal known system uh, and uh, trying to find a controller which minimizes the H infinity norm. And we're going to replace it with something very similar. So we're gonna replace it with, uh, we're gonna minimize this bound gamma, which is the H infinity norm. Uh, but we're gonna not just bound the nominal system, that would be P naught, we're going to bound every possible system that this system could be, right? So we're going to use this set notation, right? We're going to say that for every set in our, in our um, list of possible actual systems, set of possible systems, and these are linear systems, we assume that, That that h infinity norm is 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 guaranteed for any uh, assuming any any system within that set of systems. Right. Now this is a this is a very uh, it seems very simple, but of course uh, there's this question of what is p? How do we define p? Right. Because right. Uh, as I said, right, there's uh, many different sort of structurally different uh, ways to, uh, to to estimate that that p. And in fact, as we as we'll see it in the very last slide of this lecture, uh, the the field of, of robust control is actually quite fragmented. Um, so each of these like has a different representation for p, right? right. Different. And so when we get to the last slide, I'll just like list a couple, or actually I think it's like six different variations on how we parameterize this P. The purpose of this lecture then is to, to give a couple options to, to how we parameterize P, focusing primarily on the parametric uncertainty and the unmodeled dynamics parts of this problem. So, with that said, I guess the, the time has come to, to start to try and look at some of these cases and figure out how we, we, we can parameterize this 
this set of possible plants. So let's start with the easiest case. The easiest case is the case of parametric uncertainty. Uh, this is, uh, here's just a, the simplest possible system that we can consider, which is a mass spring, right? Mass spring, uh, where uh, we have force equals ma, right? This is all, all it is, right? This is acceleration, a of t. Uh, and of course, uh, we initially had m, ma, right? But we divided by m to get m in the denominators here. And this is uh, damping, of course, from our damper. It comes over there, and this is our uh, our spring. It comes from right there, right? And we uh, we can apply some force to the uh, to the to the mass, right? It also gets divided by m. Right? So now, as I've uh, as I talked about, right, we have some uncertainties in these parameters. So we have how many parameters? We have one, two, and three three uncertain parameters. The mass, which is the most obvious source of uncertainty, remember the mass of the car could be variable. Uh, the mass, uh, the, the, the stiffness of the damper, that, that's also assumed to have some variability in it. And the, uh, the stiffness of the spring, also assumed to have some variability in it. Right. So how do we model these, this variability? Well, I talked about in pre previously, right, the idea that uh, m naught or uh, the mass is say in some interval m naught plus uh, minus 10 m naught plus 10 right. so even within that sort of interval uncertainty which is entirely reasonable um, there's actually two different ways of representing it so the first is a multiplicative uncertainty and the second is additive uncertainty uh, and they both have their uses. They're both uh, preferred in cer certain regions. So I'll talk about them both. Um, additive uncertainty is more clearly linked to this, right? To this, uh, this interval representation. So we've got a nominal mass here. Right? And we have some uncertain parameter delta. And just for convenience, we usually take delta to have a unit norm, right? So some delta, we don't know what it is, but it's within one, right? And then we have some weight on the delta, right? Just uh, so that I, obviously if, if our deltas are between negative 10 and 10, we're done. We don't need this weight, right? But that just gets too confusing. So we normally just take all of our deltas to be less than one, right? And then we modify this weight according to how big we actually think the uncertainty is. Right. So in this case, uh, n a to m will be 10. And so. so that's the, that's the, that's additive uncertainty. That's the, the most direct uh, way to get from here to here. The other version is uh, parametric uncertainty, and that allows us to add a weight which multiply, which which scales with the nominal weight. Right. In, in the in the end, we can sort of we can get the same thing if we choose our eta's appropriately and our m is known. But it's generally thought that this sort of uh, is sort of a, if we we think of eta as our percentage, right? Our percentage error in our parameter, then it's a little bit easier to formulate. So we, we assume we, we've measured all these parameters and we know them all within say 10%. Uh, then of course, right, the, uh, uh, the if again, we assume that our deltas are less than one, uh, our weight is then our percentage error, right? So this would be 0.1 in this case. So in this case, we get, we have m naught plus point, plus or minus 0.1 m, right? That's percent error, right? And this, of course, holds for uh, the, uh, the spring and the, the, the damper as well. Uh, no difference here. We just uh, scale the, the weight so that the, uh, the delta is always less than one. 
And in this case, uh, it's a percent error. In this case, it's an actual measured variable. A third important case is where is, is the polytopic uncertainty, which seems very mathematical and abstract, but actually it's very pragmatic. Uh, in this, 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 in in these two cases, uh, both of these cases, oops, that's can't see the orange very well. In both of these cases, we assumed that the uncertainties, the parameter parametric uncertainties, were decoupled. So that a change in delta in, in the mass, right, is uncorrelated with a change in the uh, the spring constant, for example, or the damper. In certain circumstances, however, this is not a necessarily a good idea. So one case of this is where, say, uh, you're designing a car, right, cars, and we build, let's say. Uh, 10,000 cars. Right? And uh, each car is a little bit different. Right? Each car is a little bit different. And so we measure, let's say, a subset of those. Let's say we measure 100 cars. Measure the parameters of 100 cars. So this gives us, for every car, m, i, c, i, and k, i, right? Now, we could, of course, right, just do an interval on each of those parameters, um, but they may be correlated, right? They may, may be correlated. And so an easy way to deal with that correlation is just to create the smallest possible polytope of parameters, and this is in three dimensions. Let's call this M, C, and uh, K, right? Which uh, which uh, which encapsulates every measurement. So, say we measure uh, a uh, 100 values of these cars, right? Measure 100 values. What is the smallest uncertainty set which encapsulate every single measurement? Well, you may think that that's actually rather hard to complicate, compute, but it actually isn't, it turns out. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, uh, you form the polytope associated with all of those measurements. So for example, if we have 100 measurements, right, and we want to say that M is somewhere in the weighted average of all of those 100 measurements, so it includes every measurement and the weighted averages of every measurement. Weighted averages of every measurement. Right, we form the polytope. So this is the weight we associated with each measurement. And the weights are all positive, and they all sum up to, to, to 1, right? So that we have a, now all possible weighted averages of each of those measurements. Now, 100 measurements is going to yield 100 variables, but this is a standard form, uh, even though the, there's a rather large number of uncertain parameters. And polytopic uncertainty is actually particularly easy to deal with, and so it's in a very important case. So these are the uncertain polytopic variables, these deltas, the averages, the weights on, on each of those. Right? The measurements are known, uh, so they're fixed, and, but the, uh, the weights, the possible weights, anywhere between 0 and 1, uh, are unknown. And so we want to uh, design controllers which account for every possible weighted average of those measurements. So that's polytopic uncertainty, a very important case. Okay. 
So again, three ways of sort of standardizing, mathematizing our uncertainties. Uh, percent error, here in multiplicative uncertainty, additive or sort of interval error in additive uncertainty, and then weighted averages of measurements under polytopic uncertainty. Very, three very important cases. We, unfortunately, of course, they all have to be dealt with very differently. So for now, we're going to neglect the polytopic uncertainty, and we'll talk about the uh, parametric uncertainty. But before we do that, we're going to take a very brief break, because I know I spent a lot of time on those slides. And uh, we'll come back in a moment.